All right, hello everyone. Hello, hello, come on in. <clears throat> Just setting up the last little bit here. And got the fish cam on for your entertainment here. Okay. Hello, hello. Hello, Flannery. Happy P. Fury. Jay Gutro. Welcome, welcome. All right. Put the fish back wherever it belongs. All right. So, um, as you probably know from looking at Moodle, if you've done so, I still do not have your exams graded. I apologize. Um, I, I, we do have the uh, midterm grades coming up before too long, so obviously I do have a, a hard deadline there, but I, I really do want to have them done for you by Tuesday. So that's going to be um, my goal, um, and really going to aim for that. Again, we've just had a lot of, a lot of stuff come up this week with um, interviewees for... Um, a position within the environmental engineering group. So hopefully we can fill one. It was great, a great time uh, meeting everybody and, and hosting them with these uh, Zoom interviews. I think it went pretty well, even if it's uh, all virtual is uh, not so fun. Um, but anyway, it took a lot of time and I hope I can get those exams graded for you by next time. So today we're gonna talk about filtration again, but this time, instead of talking about the granular filtration, now we're going to focus on membrane filtration. So when I introduced the topic of filtration, we talked about having a granular media and the fact that we can filter using the sand grains or something similar to sand um, by letting water flow down through it, and it kind of acts like groundwater in a sense where all these particles allow spots um, to uh, collect. Um, a good question, are these slides not on Moodle? I did just do it as class was starting, so let me um, pull that up and show you just to be sure that they're there. Um, but I, I literally was doing that right as uh, class was starting. So under membrane filtration, um, you should now be able to see lecture slides for membrane filtration. Um, and that should be these, these slides that we're going through. Okay. Uh, so let me, let me know if you are still having trouble seeing that. Okay. All right. So membrane filtration then, as opposed to this granular filtration, which is kind of like that, um, groundwater system where you're you're having particles removed just by getting stuff on things. Great. Um, instead of that, we're doing straight up size exclusion. So, uh, you know, if, if we think about a coffee filter, the coffee filter is physically preventing the the coffee grains from going through it. Now, the coffee grains themselves you could consider as a granular media and we're having some absorption, but it's actually desorption and the, the coffee chemicals and the caffeine and the, the flavors are coming off of the, of the grounds into the water. It's basically just the same process of absorption and stuff, but in reverse. So anyway, the, um, the filter itself or a screen porch or the, the window screen is preventing mosquitoes or particles from getting inside but letting the air, the fresh air and everything else come, come through. So for water treatment, obviously, this is just going to mean that we have some particle that gets stuck on the surface here because it's too large to pass through the pores. And so we're going to talk about uh, the dynamics of membrane filtration. Um, and for the most part, this is going to be um, looking at size exclusion as the primary physical mechanism um, that's at play. So let's start with a bit of a definition and 
definition of the different things that we're, we're going to be talking about. So in terms of the utility, um, membranes are going to offer us particle removal, just like, just like the granular filtration did. Um, but we're also going to be able to go further than that. We can end up removing uh, virus-sized particles, um, colloids, and if we push it strong enough, we can, or you know, push it uh, the pore size small enough, then we can actually also remove chemicals and even ions. So you've probably heard of desalination, and there's a few strategies to do that. Using membranes, we can we can do so using reverse osmosis. So we'll talk about that probably next time uh, in terms of how reverse osmosis works and some ion exchange type of things that gets a little bit fancy. Um, usually when we're talking about membranes, we're thinking more on the, the particle or large chemical side. So um, each, each time we step into a, a smaller particle, we need a, a fancier membrane or a membrane with smaller pores, pore sizes and we end up needing to apply more pressure. We'll take a look at a, a chart that kind of shows that in a minute. Um, for the moment though, I want to kind of demonstrate what, um, what a membrane really is. So the definition, if you look it up um, online, you'll see a membrane is a thin, soft, pliable sheet or layer, especially of some sort of plant or animal origin um, and really what it functionally does is it's, um, it, it serves as a thin boundary. Um, you know, another definition would be a piece of parchment forming part of a roll. Um, so you can think of a piece of paper as a membrane, right? This, this piece of paper is fairly flat. You know, this one's been folded a little bit. It's pliable, we're able to fold it, we're able to bend it without it breaking or tearing or shattering. Um, and, and so those are the general characteristics. Now, when we talk about membranes for water treatment, we're almost always referring to a semi-permeable membrane. So it's, it's not only a membrane that acts as some surface, but it's also allowing something through it. So technically, a membrane doesn't have to let something through it, but the membranes that we have we refer to do. And, and realistically in nature, it's almost always the case that membranes are there as a boundary that controls what passes through, um, you know, a, a border. So for a cell wall or a cell membrane, that membrane is there to control which ions and chemicals are passing through. And, you know, the like a, a virus, is what it does is it finds a way to get inside that membrane. And it tricks the cell into thinking that um, it belongs inside. And then once it's inside, of course, it causes lots of problems. So we want our, our membranes to be able to control what passes in and out um, so that we, we have control of the system as a whole. OK. Um, Membranes and water treatment. A little bit of history here. We actually didn't really start using membranes until about 60 years ago for water treatment. And there's a few reasons for that. It's partly because a lot of a lot of membranes, especially early on, have been polymer in nature. So a polymer is some, you know, is a fancy word for a, a chemical that binds, like we have a, a small molecule that we can repeatedly bind it to itself and make lots of small, um, you know, one large molecule out of lots of small ones. For example, styrene looks something like this, and I've probably forgotten now um, exactly what it looks like. <clears throat> so maybe somebody can correct me if I've, I'm missing a bond here or something. Um, but essentially, styrene can be converted to polystyrene, and you may know it as styrofoam, when you link these together. And there's different ways to do it, but you link these over and over and over again, and then you have what we call a polymer instead of a monomer. So mono just being one mer, meaning molecule, so one molecule, 
and a polymer meaning multiple of those that particular molecule. So you repeat that a bunch and then you have this um, this polymer that is what we think of as plastic or rubber. It's something that we can form, we can mold, we can shape, we can uh, potentially melt or um, you know we can work with it before it polymerizes and then cause it to polymerize once we're ready for it to do so. So they're very interesting organic molecule um, technologies, I'll say. And so we really, you know, maybe we've been using polymers for a very long time, you know, rubber from trees and things, but we didn't really know or, or have the technology to advance the chemistry side until more recently, kind of in the, in the 1900s. So um, about 60 years ago, 1960s-ish, uh, we, we began to make membranes out of these and apply those to water treatment um, facilities. That really became more common about 30 years ago um, where the, a, a treatment plant would commonly use them or it would at least not be uncommon to find them in a water treatment facility. Okay, uh, another um, kind of feature of membranes is that the pore size uh, is, is proportional to the pressure required, but it's a, like an inverse proportionality, right? The smaller the pore size, the higher the pressure. And we'll, we'll take a look at that um, as we go, uh, but just kind of a, a general fact there. Okay, a, a couple of operational terms that are important. When we talk about permeate, that's going to be whatever passes through the membrane kind of sound is self-evident there. Whatever is permeating through the membrane, that's what we call the permeate flow. And that's generally what we think of as treated. Now, we can use membranes for a lot of things. Maybe we want to concentrate our orange juice and we don't want to ship, you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of orange juice across the country when it would be a lot cheaper to concentrate it down in Florida or wherever and then ship just that concentrated amount across the country or across the world, and then reconstitute it, dilute it back to it, its normal state with clean water. And then you have um, orange juice from concentrate and you know cheaper to ship that way and maybe easier to store. So I say that because the concentrate is actually what we'd be interested in in that sense. We don't, we don't really care too much about the permeate um, but usually for water treatment, we're looking at permeate in terms of that's the usable water that we're getting. That's the stuff that passes through the membrane um, and out the other side. So if we have water flowing towards a membrane and it goes through, this would be the permeate, whatever went through. Um, we would call this the feed here. So whatever we're feeding to the membrane, and typically this would be our dirty water. Um, that's uh, that's the, the feed flow fairly obviously. And then sometimes we, we will gather, you know, we could operate just with the feed and the permeate. That would be called dead end filtration. We'll show that in a minute. Um, but usually we also have some of the water bouncing off and being collected elsewhere so that we can take away a lot of the contaminants rather than let them all build up at the surface of the membrane until it's just clogs everything and we can't do anything about it. Um, so that's that's not a great case, although occasionally for small operations, we might do it dead end that way um, on occasion. So that means this this feed, this flow that's uh, leaving the membrane but has not passed through it then is what we call our concentrate. Sometimes we also call it the retentate. So that's the flow that was rejected by the membrane and is extra dirty because the feed was dirty, the permeate is clean, and the mass, simple mass balance here says that, well, the dirt has to go somewhere. So now we have, we, we haven't changed the mass here, but we've changed the volume, right? Some of the volume went through as clean water or at least partly clean. So that's where we're getting this um, concentrate is going to be um, more concentrated in our whatever pollutant or particle that we're dealing with. Okay, 
So we can describe our typical filtration that we're going to use as cross flow filtration. This is going to be uh, juxtaposed with dead end filtration. So the way cross flow filtration is going to work is we have our feed water, it's coming. This is usually in some sort of pressurized vessel. So we have some pressure here applied that's forcing some of the water to go through, right? So the, the pressure applied to that system is going to be allowing or causing water to travel through the membrane. Meanwhile, all these particles, hopefully all of them are rejected. You know, sometimes we might see cases where some of them make it through, but the, the point is that few of them make it through. Um, Maybe if we're doing kind of a simple filtration, maybe it's okay if 25% of them get through or something. And so that we'd add that to the mass balance. Um, but, you know, I, in either case, we're getting this concentrating effect and the retentate has more dirty stuff while we're also getting flow um, of clean water through the, in the permeate. Now, sometimes we'll draw this as like a box diagram and we can draw like a, a diagonal here and this is kind of symbolizing the membrane and if we ever do this just keep in mind that whatever passes to the other side of that diagonal that's going to be the permeate so i i drew four arrows here we really only need three but i drew four because i wanted to show you that you can draw it this way where then this would be the permeate both of these lines, wherever you collect it from, across the membrane is the permeate, right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter one way or the other. Both of those feeds would be called the permeate. This would be the feed. And this one would be the, the concentrate or the retentate. So now, if we were to draw this a little differently and say, instead of that, we had just arbitrarily, we drew it this way instead, then that's going to flip. Right, because now, now the the permeate, I mean, this side is still permeate right here coming out of there, but now the other side has passed through the membrane, and this one is the concentrate. So it, it really doesn't matter which way you draw it, just so long as you understand the what the diagram is saying. Um, so just, um, I wanted to, to point that out to be clear um, what that means. Now, in a dead end filtration, we will typically have just a, a membrane here. And if we're talking about flows, this would be the feed, and this would be the, the permeate. And so, so long as we are flowing water through it, we have those two flows. Um, that might change if maybe we, we started with like 10 milliliters and then we fed water through it and then we decided, okay, well, let's just stop with like one milliliter remaining. And then this water that's left, we could consider that a concentrate, but that's not gonna be a flow rate, right? That's, a, that's just a volume. So we're, we're going to take a look at a problem at the end of class where we have um, a system like this, a very simple system where we, we are concentrating a solution of uh, water, have some stuff in it, and what's remaining, it, it really just comes down to a relatively simple mass balance. Um, and it'll be good for you to have some practice just to kind of understand what's happening in that system. Um, but I'm just saying that so that you understand it really is... Um, we can't have a concentrate flow in a dead end system because that just becomes a cross flow system. Okay, so let's take a look at a few more examples. So I, I kind of just went over a lot of this, but um, these two flow regimes, we have this continuous one where we have a, uh, a permeate concentrate and uh, a feed, and then the, uh, the dead end filtration here. So 
I think you you understand these box diagrams now, so I won't uh, elaborate further there. But just kind of taking a look at what a a uh, dead end filter looks like. You, if you've ever been in a lab or um, something like that, you may have seen these little filter discs. So we can add these on the end of a syringe, and then we can use those to, as a dead end filter, we push water through applying pressure with our, our thumb or fingers um, to cause that, that liquid to be pushed through the filter disc. And then, you know, it, you know maybe our thumbs wear out and we, can, we only push until there's like that much liquid remaining or whatever, you know, we, we can either push it all through and then we have no concentrate. It's just whatever particles are on the filter and just are on the filter. Or we can leave a little bit left here and then that's our concentrated solution. So in some sense, this dead end flow is a little bit like a batch process, um, in part because this filter will get clogged and then what do you do? You have to replace the filter or take it off to clean it. Maybe you could backwash it, but the point is that you do like a, a batch at a time and you can't just do a, a continuous flow very easily because of the fouling that's going to happen. You're going to get too much junk on that filter and you know you have no flow that can take away the dirty stuff. Now, all filters will get fouled. Fouling happens in membrane filtration. Um, just like in granular filtration, you have to backwash. You're always going to have to take care of fouling in membrane filtration. Um, but cross-flow filtration really helps reduce that effect. So in some sense, the cross flow would be like a continuous reactor, like a CSTR or a plug flow reactor, whereas the um, dead end filtration acts a little more like a batch. Now, we don't actually typically have reactions occurring, so we're not going to do the, the we're not really gonna deal with mass balances in that same way. It'll be a lot more like a mass balance of two streams mixing what's the final concentration or in this case, two streams separate and only some of the mass goes across. So we have, we have a change in concentration and we need to calculate that based on what we know. So at the end of the day, the, the mass balance side of membrane filtration is rather simple and intuitive. Um, so I, I hope to get you well equipped to deal with them. And after that, the, there's just a few calculations about the difference between flux and pressure and the innate characteristics of the membrane, how porous they are, how easy is it to pass water through them. We'll take a look at a little um, look into that type of topic as well. Okay, another example for a dead end filtration unit here where you might see this in a lab where you have um, a glass vessel like this. Essentially, you're gonna put your liquid here and you'll be filtering this liquid. You'll put a membrane on top of this membrane support. So this is like a kind of a porous glass ceramic type of thing here. Um, it just is there to hold your membrane. And so you're gonna hold your membrane there and then um, essentially instead of pushing the water through uh, like we did with the syringe, we have a vacuum here uh, to pull pull the air and pull therefore the water through the membrane and then the, the permeate just drops through here. So we'll say this line, um, we can collect our permeate in a flask down below. So in that sense, we just need a, um, a vacuum, a vacuum pump or a vacuum line and then pour our water in on top and then it just pulls the water through. So it's applying a pressure difference. So we see that there's a, a delta P. So we have a difference in the amount of pressure up here versus below that's driving the water through and we can do our filtration. Um, so that's a, another standard thing you might see in a laboratory. Cross flow, cross flow filtration can look quite a bit different. Um, and we can arrange it in a few different ways. So here's just one example in a laboratory. Um, and it's a, a good example of how the flows might work 
uh, depending on what the system looks like. So in this case, we have a feed water that is dirty. So over here, this is our feed. It doesn't show up too well. I'm going to use a different color. So here's our feed water. That wasn't too much better. Um, so we see it's got this orange color, some particles or something. It's flowing up through here and into the membrane chamber. And so here we have what is very likely what we'll call a hollow tube membrane. So in here, it's kind of a, a tube where the water comes inside and then some of the water is separated outside of the tube. And so some of the water escapes and then the rest goes as the concentrate. And so this here then is the concentrate. And everything that's collected out is collected. And if you look closely, you can kind of see a, um, like a plexiglass container here. And this nozzle is potted in, um, potted just being a fancy term for like it's sealed. Um, it's like we have that, it's inserted there and then sealed so that it, um, you know, water has to come through that nozzle then. Um, so essentially what we have here is the permeate coming out clean as the, the water has flowed into the cylinder and out the, the edges or out the, uh, through the membrane and that, that permeates collected here. So there's, there's different ways we can operate a system like this. Um, this is just kind of one example here where we have that continuous flow. And over here, we have a valve that is very likely applying a, a kind of a, a constriction of flow that pressurizes the system behind it. So uh, this is causing, um, so this is requiring pressure in order to force it through. And you can actually see it kind of pushing fairly quickly through. And we see the pump back here um, applying pressure to the, the feed water. So you see that the pump is withdrawing water. This goes into the pump and then it gets pushed up into the system. So that's what's applying the pressure. And then <clears throat> through here, I mean, if we didn't have anything else in place, <clears throat> we wouldn't really expect much water to go through the membrane. So in order to do that, we have this pressure valve that's causing um, some pressurization over here so that only some of the water comes out to the concentrate and the rest is going through the permeate. Okay, so in terms of designing membranes, there's a few things we need to think about. Um, first and foremost will be the contaminant size. So what size of contamination are we trying to eliminate? What type of contamination is it? Uh, where does it come from? What does it look like? How does it act? So if we can better understand the contaminant itself or what we would expect to, um, we need to treat, then we can decide what pore size we need, which then tells us what kind of pressure do we need for a given flux that we're looking for. So just like we looked at in, with the, um, the granular filters, we, we looked at a loading rate for the filters. Well, the flux is a form of that, or rather the loading rate is a, is a kind of flux. So this is basically the quantity of water going through a given surface area of membrane um, over time. So that the flow rate per area that becomes, so Q divided by area. This is like cubic meters per square meter per second or something like it, which can then lead us to um, essentially meters per second. So it's that same concept that we were using 
um, in the granular filtration because we have some area that's useful to us to do the separation. Um, and then the, the question is how much pressure do we need to apply? Um, that's also kind of what we saw in the granular filtration where we had saw more and more water stacking up on top of the membrane, on um, top of the granular filter to push the water through. Or in some case, you could have a pressure vessel to push the water through. So the, the operational pressure then is going to be really important. Membranes, you know, some of them will be capable of withstanding very strong pressures and some of them will be too weak and will will be broken or torn or collapse based on too much pressure. So we have to be careful with our membrane design to make sure that it can handle the pressure we are um, aiming to operate at. So in combination with that, you know, the pressure is directly related to the flux. So we need to know, okay, how many membranes or what membrane surface area do we need in order to produce enough water for a given application. Okay, so with all of that in mind, let's take a look at the size of materials that we can remove and likewise the related pressure we would expect and the hydraulic flux that we would expect. So our conventional media filters this is our, our granular media. This is the stuff we just covered um, the last few lectures. So this stuff can remove particles that include sand, some bacteria, algae, um, some pathogenic cysts, maybe not all of them, um, and silt particles. So kind of the, the soil particles that are somewhere between um, sand and clay. So clay are very small particles, and it turns out our conventional media filters don't do a great job at removing clay, at least on a particle size. Um, clays may stick, maybe they're easy to destabilize, so perhaps they can stick to the granular media pretty easily, um, but certainly there are clay particles that are just too small to remove given the size exclusion type of type of situation with um, you know given the pore size because what up here what we're looking at is the effect of pore size of the different um, filters so conventional media we're talking 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers between the the sand grains um, in those systems okay so if we want to get something fancier make sure that we remove all of the bacteria because there's a portion here that are too small to be removed by the conventional ones. So we definitely have a fair bit of bacteria. Um, you know, and this is, it's not the case that one E. coli is gonna be 10 times the size of some other E. coli, right? That's, that's not what we mean when we have bacteria from here to here. That means that some types of bacteria are all gonna be about 10 micrometers you know, just like some animals are small, you know, you compare a mouse to a whale and you have at least a couple orders of magnitude difference there. Um, likewise, bacteria have different sizes. And so, you know, maybe there's some pathogenic bacteria that all of them are small enough to get through your conventional media filtration. Okay, so that means then we, for bacteria, we really want to get into microfiltration. And even there, we need to make sure that we are Kind of on the uh, the lower half of that, so the point where we're getting to, um, you know, less than one micrometer, something like, you know, you'll see a lot of 0.45 micrometer membranes. That's a typical microfiltration membrane. And those little syringe filters that we saw, a lot of those come in 0.45 or 0.22, somewhere in that range for syringe filters. Um, so that should take out pretty much all of the bacteria, um, but, you know, not, certainly not all of the viruses, maybe some of viruses. So as we move, um, and, and let's just take, take one step back here. So the operating pressure required for conventional media is about 10 kilopascals. And just kind of FYI, um, 10 kilopascals 
corresponds pretty well to about one meter of hydraulic head. So one meter worth of water on top of the filter is enough to push it through. Um, and if you remember, we, we did mention that, that there's typically one to two meters of water loaded on top of these granular member, granular filters. And so, um, and, and one PSI, by the way, is 6.9 kilopascals. So operating somewhere between one and a half to two, maybe even three PSI for these um, conventional media filters, that corresponds to one to two meters of water on top of it. So if we go down to microfiltration, um, 10 times that, we get uh, something about um, on the high end of microfiltration or the, the low end, you know, depending on how you say high or low, of ultrafiltration, um, that's where we get about 10 times the pressure. So instead of one meter, we have 10 meters of water required to drive that. Now, this is kind of interesting because there's, I've seen some uh, applications of membranes for, um, with developing countries or point of use water treatment in mind, where you have um, a, a setup called the sky hydrant, where an ultrafiltration membrane capable of removing most viruses and all bacteria uh, it can be used. And that's something like a 0 0.02 micrometer. So that's 20 nanometers. That's about the size of the smallest types of viruses. So somewhere around there is going to remove a fair bit um, of viruses. Um, perhaps not all, but it'll remove quite a few. And you can do that if you're able to suspend your water one meter up above your filter. So you can use a, a um, water tower of sorts and get that 10 meters of hydraulic head to operate that membrane. So that's a, a pretty neat solution. And, you know, you still need a, some way to pump the water up there or maybe a, a natural cliff or something where your water source is higher. Um, to, to make that work really uh, sustainably, you have to figure out some power issue there regardless, but even just having a storage tank elevated really helps. Uh, sometimes in developing countries, you'll have intermittent power um, or even intermittent water supply. So if you can store it up there and use that gravity to do the filtration, uh, it's, it's really a pretty good solution. And it's taking care of a lot of the different contaminants that um, are a concern. Okay, so if we wanna push past that, we're really getting past to the point where we can use some sort of physical or manual effort. And, and by the way, the, the, one other technology for the ultra filtration um, is a um, lifesaver bottle. Uh, if you've ever seen these, the, you can pump them by hand and it pumps through a, a membrane that pressurized that you apply, it's kind of like pumping up a, a super soaker squirt gun. Um, if you pump it enough, it's pressurizing the chamber and pushing the water past the membrane, and then you're able to, uh, to filter that water by hand. And that's another similar one where it's kind of manually powered up to a kind of a reasonable ultra filtration level. So going past that, we really start getting to the point where we, we need um, kind of high energy pumps. You'll also notice as we're going higher and higher in terms of pressure, um, our hydraulic flux is dropping. So, you know, when we take a look at our granular media filters, um, we gave some loading rate that's possible. Um, and, you know, we, we put that in liters per square meter per hour or something like that. And if we look at what we can get with a microfiltration membrane, about 100 liters for every square meter of membrane for every hour. That's kind of the, uh, the extent. Now, if we're dropping down towards, through ultrafiltration down into nanofiltration, um, by that point, we have 10 times less. At the same time, we are increasing by about 10 times the pressure required. So if you look at 
how expensive it is to go from microfiltration to nanofiltration, it's 10 squared, right? We have the, the flux is dropping by a factor of 10 and the pressure requirement is increasing by a factor of 10. So it's quite a bit, um, you know, it's a hundred times more expensive in some ways to do that. Now, it, it may well be worth it. And that may just be saying that, okay, well, microfiltration is pretty cheap. And then ultrafiltration, you know, is a, a good technology. But if we really have to start getting to the point where we are using a membrane to get rid of stuff like salts and metal ions, maybe we're trying to get rid of arsenic using a membrane, um, or maybe just the, the natural organic matter stuff in, in the water, um, you know, once we're getting down to that point or kind of the molecular level or large molecule level, um, that's when we're really paying a higher cost. And eventually if we get low enough, we can start doing what we call reverse osmosis. And that's where we're driving water across a membrane, um, even though it wants to be water, the force of osmosis wants to be keeping water with the salt because it's energetically more favorable that way we're pushing it and reversing the osmotic pressure um, by applying an external pressure we get clean water out the other side but that requires quite a lot of pressure and we don't get a high flux um, for it so all that to say you know this inverted relationship between operating pressure and hydraulic flux um, this is the main driver in terms of membrane operation cost. <clears throat> and as we, as we take a look at this, it's really important to consider what do we have to remove? Um, do we just need the bacteria and then we can kill the viruses with some chlorine later? Or do we really want to, to filter everything um, and not have that be a concern at all? Okay, so a couple different types of membranes in terms of what we build them or make them out of. We, I've talked about polymer membranes a little bit already. Um, polymer is, or polymeric membranes are very nice because they're flexible, easy to manipulate, easy to mold into a nice shape. Um, but the options we can use to clean them are much more limited because those organic molecules are, um, you know, if we're trying to clean the fouling stuff, the fouling stuff is more, you know, is usually partially organic. So we might try bleach or something to destroy that organic material, but we have to be careful so that we don't destroy the polymer membrane itself. Now the, the polymerizing process usually makes the polymer a little more stable, um, but, yeah, it's not it's not perfect, and so they are they are weak. They are susceptible to temperature. You know, you could consider baking it to drive off all the the junk that's on it, but you probably drive off the polymer materials itself. Um, these are made with lots of different types of polymers: cellulose, so that's kind of a plant-based polyvinyl chloride, so PVC. You've seen that before. Polymethac methyl methacrylate, PMMA. That's kind of a, an acrylic material. So all of those are used. There's quite a few others, um, some probably even more common than these ones. Um, if you get into the membrane sciences, you'll, you'll learn about quite a few different polymers that are used and their strengths and weaknesses. Now, there's a, a few reasons you might choose one material over another. Um, that could be um, you know, some are chemical resistant more so than others. Um, so in terms of choosing which one, so the extent to which they're resistant to chemicals, um, maybe they are hydrophobic. And maybe you like that because the particles you expect to um, foul these or be the, the most fouling problem are mostly hydrophilic in nature. So you you have the um, kind of repulsion there, um, or maybe it's reverse and you want it to be hydrophilic um, for kind of the same purpose based on what your, your fouling challenge is. 
Um, maybe you have some sort of surface charge. Again, um, charge or some you know, chemical modification. Most of these things are going to be geared towards preventing fouling um, based on the application. And of course, all the polymer membrane manufacturers are going to brag about how good their polymer is, how good their membrane is, and how good the performance is, and oh, you only need to clean it so often, or you can clean it with X amount of bleach or hydrogen peroxide or whatever they're, they're saying. Um, there's going to be some nuanced reasons why some are better than others, but at the end of the day, they're all going to be polymeric membranes subject to similar um, similar issues. They're all going to have fouling. They're all going to, um, you know, need special care in some cases, and um, ideally they're cheap, right? Some are going to be more expensive than others. So that's polymeric membranes. There's a, another class that's really more recent in terms of application and technological development. And these are ceramic membranes. Now, you think ceramics and you're like, well, we've had ceramics for, you know, many, many years. It's like the most basic technology in some sense. You take some clay and you heat it up real hot and boom, you have ceramics. But engineering the ceramics and designing it very with, with very high specificity has not been possible until more recently or, or practice. And so you can potential, potentially design a ceramic membrane, which is counterintuitive, right? We, we think of a, a membrane and we think it's pliable, it's flexible, we can manipulate it. Well, in this case, if we make it out of ceramic, well, it still might be thin and all of that, and any material that's super thin and long will have some ability to bend, but as you might think, ceramics are much more brittle, so there's a much um, smaller limit to the extent you can actually bend them. So um, that's part of a, partly a problem, but at the same time, structurally they're much more robust if you you know, put them in a nice casing and have the right support and prevent them from being bent, then they can actually handle quite a lot more pressure. So if, if you think about um, what's happening if you have, let's say, a membrane. So a membrane sitting here and the, the surface that's doing the separation is going to have really small pores. So we're going to have a, a separation layer, we'll call it, where there are small pores there, that's the really finely controlled portion. Um, small pores going through it, and water would pass you know, through the membrane or maybe across and come out the other side. Now, the rest of the membrane itself usually is structured with larger pores to allow water more easily through. And of course, this would be a th kind of a three-dimensional thing. Um, but you just imagine larger channels here, and I think we'll, we'll have a few photos, um, a few images from uh, electron microscopes, where you can see that, okay, there's a structural support here supporting this, this layer, keeping that supported nicely in the structure, but the rest of it, water can more easily flow through. So it's, it's not adding more resistance. The resistance is just across that membrane for the, you know, as much as we can. So, if that's the case, and you apply a very large pressure, you know, if you apply a, a massive pressure here, um, you know, kind of a pressure drop across across that distance, if you're, you've made this out of a polymer material, like plastic, rubber type material, well, it could potentially just squash, and then it flattens, and then you've ruined your membrane. Um, a ceramic material, is just so much stronger in that type of a system that you can operate at higher pressures. Likewise, ceramics are very chemically inert. You know, it's a mineral. It's a, a chemical that it's like a, you know, rocks and minerals typically can withstand much higher, um, much more caustic, acidic, basic um, chemistries 
especially if you select the type of uh, minerals correctly. So a ceramic is going to be very robust for chemically treating them and heat treating them. So you could potentially take a ceramic membrane and um, put it under a very high temperature and actually bake all of the stuff that can volatilize off of it because the way it was formed in the first place was a heat treatment process. So it's very temperature resistant, uh, very chemical resistant. So you can treat it with um, chlorine and you know, harsh chemicals without a problem if you're, if you're doing it right. So there's some advantages there, some disadvantages there, um, and ceramic membranes are definitely more of a recent um, addition to uh, membrane, membranes used for treatment. Okay, so what do we, how do we apply them? Um, and I wanna take a look at the physical shape of these membranes. So I mentioned earlier that you can imagine a membrane as a, a flat sheet, right? A, a piece of paper. Um, ideally, I would have taken one that's not folded. Maybe I can have a couple of sheets of paper, but it's under the fish can. So pardon me for a moment. So let's say we have one nice flat sheet membrane. Now this membrane, if we want to operate just a flat sheet membrane, we have to build some sort of casing around it to contain it and to let water flow through it, right? So we'd have to build kind of a rectangular um, tray of sorts. And then you know, maybe we could even imagine my little writing pad as as that type of tray where you put the membrane on top of it and then water it supports it and it lets water go through and um, you know it holds it now the problem with this is this is a fair fairly large amount of space taken up for just one square foot of membrane so if you're going to design it just with purely flat sheet membranes applied that way and you need you know 600 square meters worth of membrane area you're going to be in some in some hurt you know that's going to be a lot of area taken up but what you can do is you can actually take multiple sheets of sheets of this membrane and so i'll, I'll take a third here and if you're if you design it carefully then you can actually take these and wrap them into what we call a, um, I guess, a cylindrical cartridge. And then I have three times the area that was fitting in, in that rectangle. And now this is, um, we can perform all of this membrane filtration through here three times the area and you can maybe add more. And then your limitations are really more about how you can design that geometry effectively to harvest the water and do the plumbing inside that system. Um, and you get quite a lot more um, filtration per volume or per area occupied, even though you're using kind of that basic flat sheet technology. So we see here the way it would work is you have your feed solution coming in between layers of paper and you would have to design a support system and you can see kind of here where we have um, the supporting layer here this is letting water flow it's like a, a feed channel spacer so it's like acting like a a porous structure that's letting water flow right through it and across it and it's spacing, it's causing there to be space between one membrane and the next. Um, and so we have a layer that lets water through, it comes in and we have it pressurized. So part of that water goes straight through the other end and is the retentate. So as the water is flowing through, it can make it all the way through this feed spacing layer and out the other side 
that's our permeate. I mean, excuse me, that's our retentate um, as it's drawn right here. Now, if it, you know, this pressure is also pushing it and causing it to go through that membrane. So if this is our feed flow spacer, then water is coming in here and then it's getting pushed through the membrane and then it reaches the permeate collection material and the permeate collection material lets it travel inward freely until it spirals in and enters this chamber and comes out from the inside of this chamber as a permeate. So it's a little bit complex. You have to carefully design it. You have like a membrane with a, cha a feed channel spacer that lets water flow in there, cross the membrane. Once it's crossed the membrane, the only place it can go is spiraling into the center and then we harvest it from the center. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting system there. I'll uh, redraw that here because I think that'll look a little better if we kind of do that. Um, but it's certainly possible and it's kind of a clever design. So what you'll see many times in, in application is a series of these cartridges, like 10, 20, 30 of these cartridges all on one pallet boxing. And that'll be one um, set of membranes and that can occupy a very large surface area of membranes um, compared to if we were just doing a flat sheet. Okay, so another type, and we actually saw an example of this earlier, would be a tubular membrane. So a tubular membrane would be a hollow cylinder and we could have the separation layer for the cylinder. It could be, you know, Realistically, it has some thickness and that separation layer can be on the inside or the outside of this tube. So it could be that we have a separation layer on the outside or we could have it along the inside. And we would change that based on if we wanted to structure the system and operate it with an inside to out flow or an outside to in flow. Um, so in the inside out, we would be going, you know, if this is our tube, we would be operating with a feed coming in, water being pushed out. This is what we looked at earlier in the day and the permeate leaving. Um, so that would be the inside out versus the outside in. Again, we'd have the cylinder and this time we would apply our um, our plumbing and our system so that water was feeding from the outside and being collected in. And so in this case, if it crossed the membrane, this would be our permeate. This would also be permeate coming out from the middle. Um, this here would be our retentate. And of course, this is our feed. So that's our outside in versus the inside out that permeates what's coming out here. And this would be our retentate. And of course, our feed. Okay, and um, I apologize, I drew those quite close to each other. Let me kind of draw a line between them. Although that dark blue is nice. Okay, so you can see if we are operating outside to in, we want the surface to be on the outside so that we're not clogging the inner space that's not supposed to do much for us anyway. Because um, if we're if particles are coming and and encountering the surface here, that's no problem. They can get knocked off. Maybe when we back flush, they'll, they'll get knocked off loose and they'll go away. Whereas if we were operating from the outside in and the separation layer was on the inside, our particles would end up getting stuck inside the supporting layer. And we don't want that. 
Um, that's not helpful at all. So we, we want to make sure that we're not doing that. And so instead, we would operate that one from the inside out so that, again, the particles would get stuck on the surface and be able to be removed from there. So I just wanted to highlight that we'll probably work through a problem with that either in class or as a homework at some point, um, taking a look at the, the difference in surface area. Because another thing you see here is you have a greater surface area if you're doing that outside in filtration. Now, some membranes might just have the whole thing as an active separation layer. That is possible, um, but you know, it, it's generally better if you do have a, a difference there um, to orient it based on the way you're filtering. So in this example, we have a cartridge with seven, seven hol um, hollow tubes, seven tubular membranes, where here we have it going um, it looks to me like it's operating inside out. And so whatever's escaping through these membranes, it's getting caught in this interstitial space. You, know, you can see there, there will be spaces between those um, tubes and that is being collected through here. Um, whereas anything that makes it all the way through the tubes and out, that will be the retin tape. Now, chances are you'll have this all potted together and then apply a pressure valve here so that there is that pressure, driving pressure to cause stuff to go through the membrane. So that'll be, um, that would be a, a typical design there. Okay, the last physical type of membrane would be hollow fiber membranes. These are basically the same exact thing as tubular membranes, just shrunk into tiny ones. So instead of maybe several centimeters in diameter, they are several millimeters in diameter. So they're very small tubes. You can kind of see um, here in the corner, uh, kind of a small picture of what that would look like. And so you'd have potentially thousands of tiny fibers. Really, again, the, the point here being that we're increasing the surface area of these membranes because the surface area is going to be what drives um, you know, we're going to need a lot of surface area to achieve a flux, especially for the um, nanofiltration or um, reverse osmosis or, or even ultrafiltration. We're, we're going to want to have quite a lot of surface area to get the flux that we need. So these operate just like the tubular. Um, they may be a little more delicate, a few more um, constraints in mind in terms of how we design them and operate them. but Overall, it's the same deal. You want to be able to um, make the plumbing so that your, your process feed flow, the water can only go on the inside of these, and then it has a chance to go to the outside from inside out or vice versa if you operate the other way. And then whatever is not, um, does not go through the membrane is separated into the retent tape. One added constraint here is with these hollow fibers, you also have to consider, because usually the hollow fibers of these are going to be polymeric. Um, so they're going to be polymers, and you don't want to collapse these and, and squish these and end up with like a, a squished fiber that water can't get through, right? So there, there is some pressure constraints in, built in there as well. Um, whereas if you have a larger tube, probably you're building it with something a little sturdier, and so the you know, you still have some pressure constraints inherently, but um, the, the hollow fibers do have um, a little bit of structural integrity as a uh, important parameter as well. Okay, so with that, I want to give you a short practice problem. Um, we'll work through it together in a moment. I'll read it for you. Um, but in, in a sense, this is just a a simple mass balance, we don't even have to know much about membranes to solve this one. We're going to learn more of the, the membrane equations and how you know the, the pressure and the flux and the resistance factor in um, next time. So for, for this time, let's consider a membrane filter that's used to concentrate 
an algae sample for culture analysis in the laboratory. So maybe I'm taking a, some water from my aquarium to see what kind of algae is in there. A membrane with a pore size of 0.45 micrometers is used and rejects 99.99% of the algae. And I have that highlighted, I'll come back to that in a moment. The filtration cell has a volume of half a liter and can be operated either cross flow or dead end mode. Initially, the filter is operated in the dead end filtration mode. And then we're asked if the initial concentration of algae is 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter, and the initial volume is 500 milliliters, what is the concentration of algae in the feed if 450 milliliters of the solution is passed through the membrane? Okay, so take a moment here and think about how you would set this up. Think about what it's asking for. And I encourage you to draw the system. So take a moment, pause if you'd like more than a moment, and um, start working on this problem. <clears throat> As always, feel free to ask questions uh, along the way. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and begin drawing it. So again, use the power of pausing if you wish. Okay, so we have a dead end filtration system where we have some initial concentration of cells that's in half a liter of water. And we push most of that water, in fact, 90% of that water through the membrane and out the other side, that membrane is rejecting just about all of the algae. And I, I highlighted that 99.99% because I would encourage you to take a look at what that would do if you used something like 80% instead. Um, so if we simplify it, we could do, you know, we could treat this kind of like 100% of the algae is removed. Um, but tr I, I suggest you try this with 80% rejection or something like that. Just to prove to yourself that you can do it and that the concentrations make sense. Um, because if you're, if you're removing, if you're rejecting some portion of them, then the, the feed concentration that's remaining, because here we have, we said that 450 milliliters was pushed through. That means we have 50 milliliters remaining here. That's why I went ahead and labeled it that way. Because four, 500 minus 450 is 50. So that's going to be our, our volume final, we could say, whereas 500 is our volume initial. So 
consider what that would look like. If you're going to have a concentrating effect regardless, um, so long as it's actually rejecting stuff. If it didn't reject anything, then you'd have exactly the same concentration, right? So you expect if you're rejecting something, this number on a concentration basis will increase. Okay, so the question is, um, what is the concentration after filtration? So I'll say, what is C final? We know the C initial, and we know that some of that has been um, effectively concentrated. So in order to do this, you would want to know how many cells made it through the membrane so that you could know um, how many cells are remaining. So we want to know the number of cells remaining because then we can divide that by 50 milliliters, which is the same thing as 0 0.05 liters. Um, that's going to be our answer. That's going to be C final. Um, by definition. So here, we, we really just need to know the number of cells remaining and then um, do that division. So if we look at how many cells made it through, um, then we can calculate how many cells are still remaining, you know, but we also need how many cells we started with. So number of cells initial, we can say this is going to be equal to um, this number per liter times the amount of water we have, right? So this is going to be 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter, but it's only in half a liter, 0.5 liters because 500 milliliters. So this is going to give us, um, you know, 3.5 3 divided by two uh, should be, what, 1.75 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. Correct me if I got that wrong. Okay, so we have that many cells per liter, then that's our kind of our starting point. So then we look at cells, number of cells escaped. And that's going to be equal to um, essentially really 99.99% of those did not escape. So we can say that 0 0.0001 is the ratio or the the fraction of cells that did escape, we're going to multiply that by the amount of volume that we filtered because we did not filter the full 500 milliliters, we only filtered 450 milliliters. So that's going to be multiplied by 0 0.45 liters times the that starting concentration of 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. So here, um, we'll go ahead and use a calculator for that. And because it's 99.99%, it's pretty much as if nothing escaped, because this is going to be a very small decimal when we do it. So 0 0.0001 times um, 0.45 times 175 One, two, three, four, five, yeah. So that's, oops, I did that wrong. Should have been 350. Yeah, so that's our equation there. So we have 15.75 um, cells escaped. That's not very many cells that made it through. So when we're, we're talking about 350,000 cells in every liter, 
and only 15 or 16 of them escaped, that really is a rounding error. So that's why I'm saying if you try the same thing, you know, you could look at this and perform this, um, you know, you're, you basically get the same answer with rounding if you did this 100% versus 99.99% at this scale. Now, if you did a large volume of water, that'll change. But if you do this at the same scale with 80% rejection, you'll actually have a difference there and say, oh, okay, so the effectiveness of this membrane is actually fairly important. Okay, so given that, um, we have that many cells. So number of cells remaining is going to be equal to 1.75 times 10 to the fifth minus, we'll just go ahead and say 16 cells. And I don't care to carry that much um, rounding. So I'm going to still call that 1.75 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. Um, now, the real change then, that's not the final answer because we need to know the final answer in 50 milliliters because that that we just, um, sorry, that was not cells per liter, that's just cells. Um, that gives us here, that answer, the cells remaining, and now we need to divide that by 0 0.05 liters. So that's 1.75 times 10 to the fifth. Really, it's 16 less than that, but that doesn't really matter. Um, divide this by 0 0.05 liters, and then we get our final answer. And what you'll notice here is this is just going to be a 10 times concentration. We went from 500 to 50. That means our volume is 10 times lower. That means our concentration is 10 times higher. So by dividing this by 0 0.05, it's really just going to be like multiplying it by 20. Um, that's, that's literally the same thing. When you divide by 0 0.05, that's the same thing as multiplying by 20. Um, so what you'll see here is we go back up to the 3.5, 3.5 times 10, and this time we're, we're bumping it up one uh, order of magnitude, times 10 to the 6 cells per liter. That's our final answer. So in one way, we could have actually answered this question without any of the math hardly at all and just said, oh, well, it's practically you know, removing all of the algae, and we went from 500 milliliters to 50 milliliters, so we um, we concentrated by a factor of 10, so we just add a digit and you know we, we change it from times 10 to the fifth to times 10 to the sixth, and there's our answer. Um, you could have actually done that, but you can't do that if this is not close enough to 100%. Okay, so does that make sense? Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, I'll, I'll stay for a moment longer use a moment to feed my fish for you. Um, so just let me know if you've got any questions. I will answer them before I go. Otherwise, have a good weekend and we will see you on Tuesday. So maybe the maybe my fish can answer your questions for you. Hmm. 
Okay, so I guess that's that's basically it. We'll see you guys next time. Bye for now.